Hello, and welcome back to 365 Days with MXM Tune. I'm Maya, singer, songwriter, video maker, Oakland native, and a fan of office supplies. I'm also a big fan of history. I love untold stories, gross facts, hidden secrets, anything weird, dark, and funky from the past. Each day, I'm going to share a few of my favorite deep cuts with you. So let's take a look at today's stories. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff, no, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 365. Today, in 1938, a man invented something that had a hand in most papers you see. Schoolwork, pamphlets, posters, you name it. October 22nd is the day the photocopier was invented. The man behind the machine was named Chester Carlson. He tried to sell his invention to IBM, RCA, and Kodak, but they saw no use for a gadget that makes nothing but copies. But let's reverse. Because Carlson has a super interesting life story pre-photocopier. Carlson began working from an early age because his parents were both battling serious illnesses. His father from tuberculosis and later arthritis of the spine and his mother from malaria. He became his family's main source of income when he was just in high school. Between caring for his family and working, Carlson still had time to develop interest in copying images from an early age. He even started making his own newspaper when he was 10, called This and That, which he wrote and copied by hand. He was obsessed with his rubber stamp set and later his toy typewriter. Later in high school, he began working for a printer in town and created a science magazine but he was frustrated by the traditional typesetting methods and began to wish for a new method of duplication. Typesetting is a long and laborious process wherein you have to place individual letters or symbols in a machine to print a document. Eventually, the printer who hired him gave him an old printing press and he began to use it for new experiments. Since Carlson was taking care of his family in the midst of his high school education and work at the printing press, he had to take an extra year of high school. While finishing up, he was able to enroll in a work-study program at nearby Riverside Junior College in the Inland Empire of California, studying chemistry and physics. He had three jobs for all his time at Riverside College, while paying for the apartment he shared with his father. The hard work paid off, and after three years, Carlson was able to transfer to Caltech, Unfortunately, he graduated at the start of the Great Depression, and despite applying to 82 companies, he didn't get any job offers. He did eventually find a job at Bell Telephone Laboratories, but it was below his skill level, and frankly, boring. So in his spare time, Carlson began to plan inventions. He thought back to his amateur newspapers and magazines of child and teenagehood, and considered new ways it might be possible to print things. He was working in the patent department of a telephone laboratory, and working with patents not only gave him experience in the process of patenting inventions, but also instigated his desire to find easier ways to make copies. At the time, if you wanted a copy of a document, you had to retype the entire thing. Sounds super annoying. They could use carbon paper to make multiple copies while typing. If you've ever wondered where the CC and emails come from, this is it, carbon copy. But that was still a slow process and the copies often came out difficult to read. There were other common methods of making copies at the time like mimeographs and photostats, but they were way too expensive for most companies to use as a large scale. Carlson was fired from his job at Bell because of a failed business scheme that he and several other employees participated in, likely due to the circumstances of the Great Depression. Though he went through a few years of struggle, he eventually found a job at an electronics firm that fit his skills and qualifications. Always a workhorse, he decided to enroll in law school along with his new job. This meant that he was spending hours copying textbooks longhand at the New York Public Library because he couldn't afford to purchase the expensive textbooks. Inspired by this time-consuming work, he added another project to his plate, experiments to build his dream photocopier. He began in his kitchen, where the experiments weren't immediately a success, to say the least. Once, he tried to melt pure crystalline sulfur onto a plate of zinc over the kitchen stove, and he accidentally created a sulfur fire, which makes everything smell like rotten eggs. Since Carlson had experience in a patent office, he knew he had to patent his designs often, just in case they were copied. He continued his experiments, worked on partnerships with fellow inventors, eventually got a studio to work on the experiments, and constantly applied for funding. 
He eventually succeeded in creating a photocopy, but the story doesn't end here. Even though Carlson had perfected the technology, not everyone was mystified by the process of creating photocopies as he was. He approached IBM, RCA, Kodak, and the Navy, but none were interested in his vision or his invention. They didn't care for a machine that just copied things that already existed. After all of Carlson's trials and tribulations between his family's illnesses and his financial problems, he was close to giving up on convincing a company to accept his invitation. But luck intervened when a young engineer visited the studio where Carlson was working. The engineer, Russell W. Dayton, took a liking to Carlson and invited him to Columbus, Ohio, to present the photocopier. He was excited to see a machine that copied images and text with no chemical reaction. Dayton's company agreed to be Carlson's agent in selling the product, and the rest is, as they say, history. Now for today's music fact. In 2012, Kendrick Lamar released Good Kid, Mad City, which debuted at number two on the U.S. charts. It sold 242,100 copies in its first week and went on to be certified gold by the Recording Industry Association of America. Though it was Lamar's second studio album, it was his debut on a major label. Lamar stylized the album as a short film by Kendrick Lamar and had it follow the story of his experiences as a teenager in Compton. The album ended up being nominated for four Grammy Awards. And now for our final segment of the day, I'm going to be going back into my own photo archives to see what I was up to on an October 22nd in my life. On October 22nd, 2019, I played my first show in Salt Lake City, and I played it at this tiny little venue called Kilby Court, and I literally, it was the smallest venue I've ever played in my whole life, I think. It was like, technically, we could cram a bunch of people in there, but it was... It was like basically a garage. It's so hard to describe, but it was actually one of the most fun shows I've ever played. I was literally just the same height as the audience and everyone that came was so sweet and so supportive. And I just remember it being really cold in Utah that day because it was on the edge of winter and people, we just warmed up the whole room and got people excited and sang songs with the ukulele that I had brought in my band. So I just have good memories of that first show and I can't wait to go back eventually to Salt Lake. And that's all for today's episode. Come back tomorrow and remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and follow along at 365 Days MXM Tune on all platforms. I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you tomorrow. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff. No, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 360